Our second speaker for today is Giacomo Spiegler. Uh, Giacomo is also assistant professor in the Department of Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence, where he works on a range of topics concerning primarily deep learning and deep reinforcement learning. Giacomo received his PhD in computational neuroscience at the University of Sheffield, and incidentally obtained his bachelor's degree in computer engineering from the same university where Murat was a PhD fellow, namely the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. In a recent study co-authored with one of our students, Giacomo explored the important issue of ethical use of machine learning algorithms by comparing the privacy, utility, fairness, trade-off in different neural networks. But what he's going to talk to us about today is a project that he was working on during the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic and the ensuing lockdown, Giacomo invested time and resources in acquiring hardware to be able to create a low-cost robotic hand with sensors that can be built locally and used for scientific research. You can see the hand already in the picture, and uh, in just a few seconds, Giacomo will tell us a little bit more about that. Check on the floor, yes. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so, okay, yeah. So in this talk, actually today, uh, I will talk about the Tibor hand, uh, the hand next to me, but I also want to talk about uh, some recent advancements in the field that are uh, changing uh, the way we think about robotics. Um, so we're gonna lead, um, well, um, lead you to a journey about the recent developments in the past few years of, uh, of uh, the field of robotics. So first, we talk about end-to-end -end, uh, learning. So we, in order to understand what is end-to-end -end learning, we need to go back and see how we're doing things before uh, the deep learning evolution of around 2012. So if you think of traditional ways of doing artificial <clears throat> intelligence, like tasks on the left, like speech recognition, computer vision, or, or any other task, uh, the typical approach was to build a pipeline with a lot of interacting components and try to encode the, what we believe was the way uh, to solve the task. So for example, what we wanted to do uh, a transcribed text from audio would make an acoustic model to, uh, uh, for example, our uh, ears perceive sound uh, uh, on a logarithmic scale. So higher frequency are farther spaced away than lower frequencies. So we are first extracting features like this, then make a phonetic model to recognize phonemes Concatenate them together into words, then build a grammar to detect what sequence of word was possible and whatnot, and then actually get text. Now, it turns out that uh, we, if you do the same, the same type of task with a single neural network, but yeah, a deep neural network, and you let the computer do the optimization for you, you always provide you have an update and compute power, but in general, you always get much, much better performance than the human uh, manually designed system. So this has been true uh, in a lot of fields. So we got uh, superhuman performance on speech recognition, uh, translation, text generation, computer vision, and, uh, and a lot of similar tasks, and especially in the past few years. But all of these happened within the last 10 years. And some of these fields like machine translation or robotics are even, uh, even more recent than that. So the question is the following. We saw a significant advance in all these, uh, we call them supervised learning tasks. So we already have a label we have a picture, we know what's in the picture, is it a cat or a dog? So you can make a label and ask the system to predict it. And, and that works really well. The question is, can we do the same to learn a behavior completely autonomously? We say it's end-to-end -end because we start from raw data, uh, for example, uh, pixels, so an image in pixels, or in audio as a waveform, not even a spectrogram. And we want the neural network to predict directly an output in the, the proper output space. Could be a label or what's in the picture, can be actual text generated and transcribed. So it's end-to-end -end because we start from the raw data and we get directly to the output. We know intermediate steps. And the model is asked to do this by itself. Again, computers are really good at this. So we already have system that can do this better than humans uh, on a wide range of tasks. So the question is, can we do the same with robotics? And this is not my slide. Huh? This uh, is, it was from a couple of years ago. People at the main research institutes in the world are actually going in this direction, at least in some type of research activities. 
So uh, we did not come up with this. But again, uh, uh, quite some people are moving in this direction in the field, and it seems very promising. So when we talk about end-to-end -end learning robotics, we talk about we mean about starting from a row sensor. Could be uh, the position of the joints of the robot, could be uh, accelerometers, or in general, could be uh, a pixel from cameras. So the robot could have uh, cameras in their <laughs> eyes or outside looking at uh, the task the robot is doing. And the output in this case is directly motor command, which could be torque to apply each motor or could be the angle of each joint. So how or what angle to put uh, uh, each joint of the body of the robot at. And we don't tell the robot how to do it. We simply say, okay, you have this situation, you need to solve a task, and here is your body, just, just do your, your thing. You know, and want to, want to be able to do it better than, than uh, we could do it by uh, designing the system by ourselves. So this is similar to what we've been uh, uh, successful on uh, in a related task, but that still are not on, uh, on physical robot. So it turns out that if you want to learn a behavior rather than a supervised learning task like uh, uh, output labels or transcript text, you have to do a slightly different system. For example, we see it in a couple of slides, uh, deep reinforcement learning. But it's still kind of deep learning applied to learning a whole behavior instead of just predicting a single label. And this been successful, uh, tremendously successful in the last few years. In 2016, uh, uh, AlphaGo by DeepMind uh, won against the world champion at Go. Uh, that game of Go is actually very challenging because it got a branching factor of 200, which means that at each uh, decision, at each uh, turn, a player can make up to 200 valid moves. And that means that traditional search-based method, search method uh, cannot be successful in this topic. But deep learning uh, was used to learn basically in artificial intuition to predict what could be good moves. And it turns out that it was extremely successful because now no human player can compete with, uh, with computers at Go. Similarly, a couple of years later, 2018, 2019, both the Mind and OpenAI uh, extended these similar systems to play a, a, on challenging games like StarCraft 2 and Dota 2, which are easy for humans to play, but very, very difficult to play at a professional level. So there actually are uh, international tournaments, and the world uh, human experts on these games are tremendously better than the average uh, human player. But now computers can, can defeat them at those games. And these games are very complex. A game uh, at, dot, uh, at Dota 2 can last for one hour. And computers have to make a lot of decisions that will have an impact on the performance of the game one hour later. So that's kind of uh, very challenging from a com for a computer to do. And yet our current system can already defeat the, uh, the best human players at the task. So in this case, we still don't have a body. But uh, we are still dealing with decision-making problems and learning a behavior. So the computer is learning to play this game uh, better than humans. And we can do the same in simulation and uh, using complex uh, uh, bodies, like you can see in the top right corner on the bottom right corner. And uh, in this case, the robot can learn to do very challenging uh, tasks, controlling artificial bodies in simulation. And that also works uh, uh, pretty easily with current uh, state-of-the-art techniques. Uh, you can do it on a single GPU in a single computer and, uh, and obtain a fantastic performance. So the field is progressing uh, in, you know, in a promising direction. So the question is, we want to do the same in robotics. Robotics, uh, as we've seen a bit, uh, is much more challenging than many other AI tasks because robotics is incredibly expensive and uh, has a lot of uh, um, hard engineering problems they need to solve uh, before even applying uh, your algorithm or your, uh, or your brain to control the robot. So a lot of kind of baseline difficulties that are uh, separate from the research work but they still have to solve and to deal with if you want to, um, to, to use this robot. So that you, it leads to, a very, uh, to much slower progress than other fields in AI, unfortunately. But we're going to work on that and to make it a bit more accessible. OK, first, we talk about end-to-end -end learning robotics. Uh, this is a kind of a, 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 a bag keyword. It can mean a lot of different things. So there is not one single way to do it. The idea of end-to-end -end learning is that uh, you have a robot that is controlled by taking row sensor data and cameras as input, and then outputs directly motor commands to control the body of the robot. Okay, so no intermediate step, uh, no modules designed by humans to, to tell the robot how to do it. The robot finds out how to do it by itself. So how can it do it? Well, the typical way to do it is called deep reinforcement learning. That means that uh, we have a robot that learns to do a task by trying and error. And while doing the task, at every time step, every decision the robot makes um, comes with a reward. So the, the robot will receive a reward uh, or a punishment. That's just a number, like a plus one or minus one, depending on whether the robot is doing well or, or, or bad. And we can design a reward function that tries to encode how 
how well the robot is doing on a certain task. Then the robot adds these rewards together, just uh, sum them together. And uh, we use a reinforcement learning algorithms that allow us to find the parameters in your network such that uh, the robot will collect as much cumulative reward as possible during interaction. And that's what has been done by OpenAI in the top right corner. In this case, the robot had to do a cubic orientation task. So it had to uh, move uh, this little color cube in the hand um, to move it into a target 3D orientation of, of the cube. Now, this task is extremely challenging, even though it looks simple, because this hand, that hand has a 20 degrees of freedom, so it's very high dimensional outer space, and uh, it's a very challenging motor task. So if we were to do this with traditional control-based method, uh, we would barely be able to do something that maybe has a, a fraction of the performance of this system. But with end-to-end -end learning, the robot learns to do it uh, very well. Now, that costs a lot of money and it also requires a lot of compute power. But we're, you know, the field is improving and the algorithms are improving, so it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to do this kind of activity. Another way, uh, so one problem, however, of reinforcement learning is that we need to encode a word function. So we need to write a mathematical function that, given a certain behavior of the robot, will tell how well the robot is performing. It turns out that this is actually very difficult to do because we can create a function that uh, we believe encodes the, the structure of the task. And then we find out that the robot learns to do a different task that still collects a very high reward, but does not do what we actually wanted to do. And that's because uh, that's called the problem of reward specification. So it's very difficult to encode the task in a, a reward function using a reward function in a unique way. So ways around it are, for example, imitation learning. Imitation learning is similar to the idea of humans. Uh, showing how to do a task to another human. So if I want to show you how to make coffee, I will just make coffee in front of you, and then you will be able to do it right after me, right? So that is still not how it works in the field. That's very difficult to do, uh, but we are moving in that direction. So in practice, what happens is uh, we can treat the uh, uh, learning behavior as supervised learning by collecting a trajectory of motion. For example, in this case, in the bottom left, uh, we have uh, a motion tracking system that capture the different type of, of movement of a dog. And then these movements are remapped onto, onto this quadruped robot by mapping the position in space of the pose and the hips and the shoulder. And then uh, the robot is, uh, is, is trained in a supervised learning way by mapping the angles of, uh, of its joint uh, such that uh, the movement it will produce will be as close as possible, as soon as possible as the movement of the, of the actual dog. And as you can see in the GIF uh, in the bottom, it actually works very nicely. The robot, of course, has uh, many fewer degrees of freedom than, than the dog, uh, but you can see the movement of uh, turning of itself, uh, walking backward and forward. Uh, it's kind of realistic if you think that this body has a uh, relatively few degrees of freedom, while the one in the top, uh, in the top row has got, I think, uh, 72 degrees of freedom, which is uh, insane for current robots as uh, hardware-wise. But again, we are getting there. So that's an alternative because we don't have to specify a reward function. We only have to show to collect data. And, and use it to train a model. And we know that if you can collect data, deep learning works fantastically well. So that, uh, that's a promising approach. Lastly, we know that uh, collecting data is cheap, but collecting and labeling data is expensive. So there is a trend in all fields of uh, deep learning in general, not only, uh, not only robotics, of going towards unsupervised or self-supervised learning. Self-supervised learning works by giving a task, um, so uh, giving a training signal that is independent from the current task. For example, I don't know if you can see the picture, it's a bit small, but in that case, uh, the robot arm is interacting with objects in the environment and it's not receiving a reward uh, or being told how to do, what to do. It's simply moving at random in the environment. But if it moves objects and then the configuration as seen by the camera changes, then the robot receives a reward. So the robot uh, basically is rewarded by uh, doing exploratory behavior. So by doing so, uh, the robot ends up learning useful behavior that don't have a purpose per se, but once you take those learned behavior and you fine tune them on a new task, then it's much easier to learn because the robot has already learned some useful motor commands and some useful visual system. So again, uh, you can do end-to-end -end learning in a wide range of ways. There is not a single answer. Usually we can combine many of these systems uh, together. But the idea is that you want to have as little supervision as possible. You might want to collect data to create a reward function, but you don't want to tell the robot how, uh, the robot how to do a task. You want the robot to learn uh, to find the good way to do a task by itself. Because again, as we saw um, uh, with traditional machine learning, computers usually find better behavior or better performing systems if they are led by themselves without telling, without enforcing too much structure on the solution. 
However, there are more benefits to this uh, if you do end-to-end -end learning rather than uh, uh, typical uh, traditional methods in robotics. So here I have two hypotheses. I'm working on testing them, so they're still untested, so take them with a very big pinch of salt, okay? Um, but I think they're kind of reasonable, so I hope you will agree uh, with me on this. Okay, the first one is more methodological. So if you have a simple task, uh, imagine you have uh, a robot that has to follow people. You can do it uh, pretty successfully with traditional robotics method, which means that uh, you have a, a system based on components, and one component will use a deep neural network to recognize uh, where a person is an image and to track them. Another component will implement the control of the, of the robot to move it around uh, and to try to see if the person is to, at the left of your visual field, the robot will move left. Uh, if it is to the right, move right, otherwise it will just move forward. And you can engineer the system very easily. The problem is that because it is based on if-then rules, huh, it can break easily. So if uh, you increase the light in your room by a lot, um, then uh, uh, the camera gets flooded by light, and your system that was trained on a certain type of images will not recognize the person anymore, even if the person is in front of the robot. Then the robot will stay still and will not follow the person anymore. So it will break in a kind of dumb way. The, so that, that's another limitation. However, if you were to do the same with with end-to-end -end learning, you will have a, a significant overhead in engineering complexity. You might have to make a, a simulation uh, to train your system on. You might have to train uh, to collect a lot of data for imitation learning. You might have to do um, uh, you know more to spend more compute power to do the training. So for simple tasks, uh, you have an overhead when doing end-to-end -end learning, which make me make it less uh, appealing than traditional methods. However, if we start improving uh, uh, the system by making software libraries more readily available and, uh, and easier ac improve access to this type of research, it, we could actually lower this bar and make it easier anyway. So that's what, one thing we want to do in the future. All right, the hypothesis is follows. If you take traditional methods and you apply it to a very complex task like making coffee, then uh, your system breaks down. There is just no way the current methods are able to do them right now. In the future, they might be able to do it, but it takes significant engineering complexity to the system. The reason that you have too many interacting components and all of them have to work with uh, basically perfect performance, because if a single module breaks, the whole behavior collapses. You know, if the robot cannot detect where is the mark that it needs to take to make coffee, it cannot do the whole behavior only because that single component has broken. And that means that you know it increases the chance of the whole system failing. But if you have a setup and all the engineering uh, setup to do training of the system end to end, uh, changing tasks can be as simple as changing the simulation to model a new task uh, or changing a reward function, and then uh, adding more compute power. And then uh, you know without changing anything as in your system, you might have the system as a robot that learns to do a new task uh, in the same way as just learning to do a simpler task. So the hypothesis here is that uh, by increased tax complexity, you have a, a, a quite an overhead of engineering complexity when using end-to-end -end learning, but uh, it will scale uh, much, uh, much more uh, uh, linearly than traditional method that would uh, at some point blow up and become useless uh, if the task become too complex. The second hypothesis is that uh, if, you, is that if you have uh, an end-to-end -end monolithic system, for example, you see a, a one single neural network that takes a row sensor as input and outputs in action, um, instead of having these interacting components, you might produce a behavior that is much smoother. What I mean is the following. If you have multiple interacting components, if one of them breaks, the whole behavior collapses. And each of them is kind of on off. So if uh, that module is not working, all the other modules cannot work because they rely on the information coming from that module. So an example could be a vacuum cleaning robot that does not have any obstacles, so it moves forward. Then you raise the wall and bumps into the wall and then detects that there is a wall. So it changes behavior and just goes backward for a, for a fixed like one meter, and then it repeats the behavior. But because there is only one way to go forward, uh, because it's kind of stuck in that little corner, it keeps going backward and forward, forward, backward, forward, backward in a loop. And you look at that to see, okay, that's a dumb robot. You know, it's literally an if-then rule that broke because the sensor did not detect the obstacle. And then uh, that component was about detecting the obstacle during planning has broken. And even if you don't work in robotics, you look at this robot, the behavior of this robot, and you can tell that any if-then rule kind of broken in a binary way that is either working or not working. So the hypothesis is that here, uh, if you have a monolithic system, they do not have a single on-off behavior or binary behavior because they will not be relying on an individual module to, do the, to, to perform its behavior. But you might find out that um, there are better ways to do the task even with incomplete information. Another example is uh, a robot, like a, a robot dog that uh, keeps wagging the tail if you smile. Now, it has to detect that there is a person in the camera 
and the person is smiling. And if the text smiling person, it starts wagging the tail and it's happy. But if the light increases in the image, uh, then the robot doesn't attack the person or the face expression anymore. And the robot is just staring at you and doing nothing. See, okay, that's a dumb robot. But if you do it end to end, uh, the robot might not actually need to know that there is a face in the picture. If there are some feature in the image that correlate with the behavior, like about you smiling and the robot having to do a certain behavior. So sometimes we, we introduce too much, uh, um, we, uh, we believe that the system requires too much information to, be, to do its behavior, while it can actually do away with much less information. And if you train the system end to end, uh, you can get this behavior in a much simpler way than we expected or than we thought was needed. And that can lead to more robust system. And now we are working on some uh, experiment to test the positive. We started training some robots and collecting some data. So hopefully we will have some more uh, data to actually test whether these hypotheses are true or not. But this gives an idea about uh, why end-to-end -end learning could be, uh, could be interesting compared to the robotics, even setting aside the fact that uh, when you have a computer optimizing behavior, it usually learns behavior that's much more, uh, much more powerful, much more performant than the manually designed behaviors. OK, this was kind of a background to give an idea about uh, this uh, exciting new uh, area of robotics that is developing in, uh, in the last very few recent years. But let me talk, uh, talk about briefly what we are starting to do in, along uh, this direction at Tilburg University. So first, we need to uh, find a couple of uh, problems that if you do robotics, uh, you are probably aware of these problems. If not, you may not be aware of this. The main problem in robotics, okay, there, are two, okay, there are a couple of main problems in robotics. One uh, big barrier to, that prevents most research groups from doing research in robotics is cost. Robot platforms, even very simple one, costs no less than $10,000 and can be easily half a million for a single robot. This means that unless you have a very well-founded company or you have a big grant to pay for your robot, or uh, you know, it, it's very difficult to do a research on the topic just because you cannot have access to the, to the platform. Remember that if fewer people can do research on the topic, the field progresses lower. If more people can work on the topic, then the, the, we can get more engineer and scientific advances faster. So we get robots in every house faster, you know, if you can get cheaper robots. Other problems they're saying is that if you do end-to-end -end learning in robotics, there is significant overhead because there are engineering complexities about designing the system uh, from the point of view of software. So hard engineering, not uh, even algorithm, how to implement the algorithm. It's just the uh, basic engineering of how to make these things work and how to write this code. Because there are no standards yet in the field, uh, think of something like Keras, PyTorch, or TensorFlow libraries. Uh, that make uh, development in those fields uh, uh, very easy. Now, now you can do image classification in literally three lines of code with these libraries. There is no yet any such equivalent for robotics. There are no standards yet uh, fixed for robotics, which means that uh, uh, people who want to do research on the topic have a much a higher uh, a barrier to access for this type of research. And last but not least, uh, of course, the algorithms are still improving. They're still not super effective. They are very powerful, they can learn very complex behavior, but there are still behavior we cannot learn with current methods. So uh, this is an active our research and people are improving the methods to make this, uh, this system capable of learning more difficult tasks. And I know um, they can be more useful. But we started from the first problem. Um, and the first problem was uh, uh, the cost of, of the robot platform. So commercial uh, uh, robot hands in this case, uh, these are used for research on dexterous manipulation. So if you have a, if you have an object, uh, you know you want to move it in your in your hand uh, or or do complex manipulation objects in uh, um, in your environment, you usually need the hands with the very many degrees of freedom. And the commercial existing hands uh, cost uh, uh, a lot of money. So the one from OpenAI, the one with cube orientation, costs three hundred thousand dollars. And another one that is similar to this one cost uh, $15,000 plus uh, service and uh, taxes and a lot of uh, money. And even that is pretty cheap for a robot, it's still uh, uh, out of budget for most research labs. And in particular, you can imagine like third world country that have even uh, less funding. So um, that prevents many, many people from doing uh, research on the topic. So the first thing we did is uh, develop designing and, uh, and building uh, this hand, is the people hand, it's got 16 degrees of freedom, and uh, is uh, pretty capable of doing uh, most uh, dex of manipulation tasks we care about. And most of the, of the uh, benchmarks in the field, uh, uh, this hand uh, uh, is capable of doing them uh, mechanically. 
But because it is actually really cheap and it's a very low cost uh, research platform, we actually plan to sell it uh, to other research labs at a very low cost, a, sign a small fraction of the, any existing alternative so that we can improve access uh, to research and that uh, more labs can have uh, do research on next manipulation, which means that we're gonna get uh, a robot that can do complex, uh, mm, complex manipulation in, uh, you know, in, in every unstructured environment sooner. And then we get the robots in every house, you know, in uh, maybe 10 years instead of 50. But the main reason we developed this hand uh, is to be able to do research on, on it. So uh, we're not interested in the, in the engineer of this hand or the mechanics. We're interested in what we can do with this hand. And the first objective is to replicate the OpenAI work on the cube orientation. So this already works very well in simulation. And we are uh, in, uh, currently these days in the process of extending um, transferring this learning behavior from simulation to the real robot. Okay. And uh, hopefully within a couple of months that uh, we might have uh, um, the cube orientation demo running on, on the robot handle. And after that, we can start doing a lot of uh, many different baselines and doing different tasks and uh, work on the sim to real transfer that is transferring behavior learning simulation to the physical robot. Okay, so now we have the platform and now we can use it to do this uh, exciting research. And in the process, develop uh, new methods to make it uh, cheaper, to require less compute power uh, and thus less money to do the training, and also to make it uh, better, smoother, and well, and uh, uh, better performing. So, end to end robot, uh, learning robotics uh, is an exciting uh, new uh, development in the field, uh, and uh, I strongly believe uh, it's going to be a major uh, contribution, in, well, a major component in any uh, robot that will. Uh, exit the factory. So if you want robots in day-to-day -day life uh, in your house or in the street, uh, it almost certainly will have to use some of this technology, but that's my opinion, of course, but I'm pretty confident in this. And I think we will discuss, talk about it in the discussion after. Um, yeah, I also believe- have, If you would have some time for that, yeah, you yeah. should start rounding it off. Yeah, 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 this is the last slide. <laughs> um, the next thing we want to do is, uh, and this is again not the primary uh, objective of our research, but just because now we have this hand and we can manufacture it at a very low cost, we actually have a side benefit of this research that is of improving access to research. So we can actually help other research teams all over the world to enter this area of research and to work on dexamine manipulation using a single standardized platform that people can uh, uh, share code on uh, in an open source way. The hand itself it will be made open source and, uh, and also pre-trained neural network could be exchanged between different research labs. So that's a, a byproduct of our research, but it can have a major impact in the field, with, uh, hopefully. Lastly, uh, we are also planning to do other exciting research on end-to-end -end robot learning, uh, even without using the hand. So one part is about using the hand and all the exciting things we can do with this hand. But other things are planning, uh, I'm starting to work on uh, uh, reinforcement learning from human preferences. So learning a reward function based on human feedback rather than, uh, than a hard-coded reward function. I plan to, uh, I'm actually currently testing the hypothesis I put in the previous slides about the advantage of end-to-end -end versus traditional robotics methods. And uh, finally, we also plan to do some research on, uh, on a smooth state operation and dexter state operation using this robot hand uh, and uh, attached to a robot arm. And if any student, Tibo University or United Universities is interested in this topic, please contact me because we have a lot of open projects we are uh, seeking for collaborations. I think we should uh, bring uh, Morat in yep. as well and uh, go for a, a little discussion on these topics because I could ask many questions on this, but uh, uh, let, let's see if we can make it a bit broader. <laughs> so well, let's leave so the robot hand is nicely in the middle here. Um, so what I wanted to know actually from both of you, you, you brought in different perspectives on robotics where uh, Giacomo went into a lot of the, the, the technical aspects on, on, on and the cost of robots and uh, Murat talked uh, about the social aspects and the, 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 the ethical aspects of, of robots. And when I look at robots uh, in the world, uh, robots have been used already for a long time, but it seems to be mostly limited to factories and then people stay away from these robots because it's too dangerous to get close. And we see uh, already for decades, we have these talks that robots are gonna get more in society and we gonna see robots helping elderly and we see robots uh, doing uh, traffic control and things like that. And that still isn't happening. And I can assume that uh, Giacomo brought up cost that, that might be part of it, but probably there are many aspects why we 
don't see robots yet that often in society. So can you give me a perspective on what the reasons are that we don't see them right now, uh, at least not much, and, and when will this happen? And what, what problems do we need to solve before this happens? So maybe Murat, could you start? Because we haven't heard from you for a while yet. Yeah, sure, <laughs> I, can, uh, I can discuss this one uh, quite a lot, but uh, to be super brief, why we don't have robots in our daily life. The one problem is engineers or machine learning uh, modelers do not design their uh, algorithms or models to be deployed on the society. Okay. So one of the problem, for instance, they, their models are not explainable enough. Like if the system fails, the users cannot trace why this decision made by the robot. Especially this is true for end to end system like uh, Giacomo introduced. Of course, the, this kind of system can provide some emergent property for the robots, but it, uh, it will not increase, let's say, quality of life of the humans in that perspective. If it fails, it has to explain why it has to fail. So that's why we are still not trust robot to put our house or educate our children or to be part of our daily life. And yeah, that will be my main uh, comment. Okay. I feel uh, in a different perspective, I think the main problem is actually more practical. I mean, the, the, there are so many uh, immense, uh, you know, economical and practical uh, applications for robots uh, that everybody, you know, would, would, you know, not everybody as a daily person, but uh, any company would actually want to, you know, put robots everywhere. I think the problem are um, the technical. So one is the cost. And now I think we are getting an exciting development. So cost of robot is, is still high, but it's falling really rapidly. So the field is going in the right direction. And especially advanced 3D printing, like also the handy 3D printer, uh, is uh, making much cheaper to, uh, to build this robot. So that uh, is something. But that's like one thing. So if a robot costs 50,000 euro, of course it cannot be in every house, right? And it costs more than like a, a luxury car. Another problem is that uh, uh, why it works in factories and not in their life is that uh, uh, day, uh, day to day life is unconstrained. We call it a, an unstructured environment. So every house is different, you know, different light condition, different objects, different people. And if we need robots that uh, can interact you know, in an uh, environment they've never seen before. And I believe that the traditional robotics method are where this fails. So if you engineer a system to work in a certain setting, you, can predict, you cannot predict every setting it will, it will work on. But if you have end-to-end -end learning, you have systems that uh, can be trained to be actually much more generalizable. Uh, out of train distribution generalization is a major feature of, uh, of deep learning and a major area of research. And also, when you have systems that can uh, learn end-to-end, -end, you can actually design them to be continue learning after deployment. So you have seen that not only are more generalizable, can work in more environment, but can also learn and adapt to the new environment. And um, you cannot do this with traditional methods. Of course, you can do it a, a deep learning based component like perception pair with traditional method, but then you still have the point of failure later on. So I feel that going in this direction with uh, a heavy end to end learning will uh, improve uh, this um, uh, behavior in, us, in a novel environment and make it uh, actually practical to use. And then, of course, once you have that uh, lowering cost, uh, is uh, a, a product engineering. Uh, Thing sure. and that can be can you know there are many ways to to work on that. And once you have uh, something that works uh, low in the cost, uh, usually is feasible. But if we look mm -hmm. at the future, so I know future uh, futurology is is a very yeah. different topic and difficult topic. But um, do you have expectations in this? What kind of robots would we see introduced, and at what point? I know it's pure speculation, but yeah. uh, the, what have you any idea on that? Uh, what kind of robot that we will see in the future? Yeah, in the near future. So what, what would be the first thing that we would see change in this respect? Any idea? First, we should change our culture. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Okay. And we should uh, consider a robot as our part uh, daily life. It's like, like, like in Japan, right? Yeah, like in Japan, Japan or like we are using smartphone. And mm -hmm. we will have a personal robot or daily life. So that culture change should be uh, made. Another one, we need a big research budget for this one, <laughs> yeah. to be sure. Yeah. And lastly, for the, of course, I'm a human robotics researcher, so I will be happy to see a lot of human robots around, but it will not start from the human robots, I guess. Okay? Like, it starts from the Roomba robot that cleans our yeah. house, and whenever you disassemble the Roomba robots and you see there is a dirt, so it indicates that it, it's, uh, it's a job in that sense.
So then it will gradually increase until we reach the humanoid robot. And we definitely need humanoid robots in our daily life because every kind of systems in our uh, surrounding designed for humans, okay? like the weight, uh, height of this uh, table or the structure of this uh, cup, everything designed for uh, human affordances in that sense. So that's why my prediction, it will not stay with humanoid robots, but it will converge to humanoid robots in our daily life. Yeah. Anything you want to add? Yeah, come on. yeah, I agree. And also, I don't see many ways in which human robotics can uh, ever be truly cheaper. So it can be, of course, much better than currently is, but they still be very, very expensive, you know, five, ten thousand euro minimum. Exactly. So that means that it's not going to be like as a smartphone ever can have so to be no, no less than. But I have a, a personally a, a vision about this that so I, I will be advising my answer now, but I have a vision about this, so I will want to work on this, uh, but I think it will happen. And it's about uh, uh, robot pets, not meaning like a robot dog, but meaning like as general companion robot. The idea is simple. Um, and if you want to make a domestic helper robot, you need to have a robot that can solve very, very difficult tasks, like making coffee, cleaning. Uh, and those are difficult tasks for, for a robot to do. We will get even current technology, you know, the current end-to-end -end methods with the proper development and improving the methods, will be able to do it uh, you know, in the future, but not now. So it's a too big of a shot. But robot pets don't need to do a task. They have to be entertaining, interact with you socially, but they don't need to you know, clean your house. They don't have to do a difficult task. So I think it's something that we can do with current technology or we are very close to be able to do it. And that's something that will have a, a tremendous social impact when if we manage to get them to the point that I, I can, I'm imagining them in a proper kind of life, like uh, um, uh, kind of like an actual life form, like they can really interact in a complex way. But then uh, uh, the, the implication will be massive. And uh, so we, I think the first robot we see in every house will probably be robot pets rather than other domestic helpers, aside from the room, by you know, or, or practical single task robots. Thank you. Uh -huh.